Welcome everybody. Uh, let's talk about information illiteracy part two or three, depending on which class you're in. And this lecture is about journal quality. And so the outline of what we're going to be talking about today is going to mention the gold standards that hopefully you know already. Uh, then talk about new problems with identifying journals. Uh, and the quality of journals, and then solutions to some of these problems. So uh, this is an extension of the original PsycInfo uh, recorded lecture about peer-reviewed, primary, and empirical. And speaking of that, I often say the gold standard, that is uh, what you should recognize as a good article or characteristics of a good article in psychology, is that it should be empirical. Uh, that it's based on structured and objective observations. It should be primary, should be written by the researcher who collected the data, and it should be peer-reviewed, uh, that is the journal requires articles to be reviewed before publication. And so these are usually uh, up until maybe about 20 years ago or 10 years ago, the things that we, uh, the filters that would really ensure that we have good quality research and that I could teach to a student that this is how you find good quality research. Uh, things have changed and so uh, we need to look a little bit deeper. So the new problems that we have, uh, one new problem is known as predatory, predatory journals and by predatory that as in like sharks and bears they are out to eat people. Uh, predatory journals are journals that are in the exist to essentially prey on researchers and try to get money from researchers. Uh, these journals uh, accept articles quickly with little or no peer review even though they say they're peer reviewed. Uh, they will uh, talk to academics or try to solicit academics to submit articles and only after going through some long process will they tell the uh, academic that there are fees associated with their papers. Uh, they campaign for academics to submit articles or serve on editorial boards. Uh, they list academics as members of editorial boards without their permission. Uh, they appoint fake ac academics to uh, editorial boards. They mimic the name or website style of a, in more established journals and they make false or misleading claims. False location, false ISSN, that is uh, the library location uh, you know, uh, number, uh, false impact factors, and false indexing. So they are just lying and you can't trust them. And now uh, what that means is as students without that much experience, you cannot trust any journal. So. Uh, you know, that is one issue that we have to worry about, these predatory journals. Uh, another problem is the proliferation of low quality journals. That is, uh, it's not a predatory journal in that they're, they're actually trying to do something, uh, you know, to, to publish articles and to share information among scientists, but for some reason or another uh, it's not the, you know, the best uh, quality research that they're sharing. Uh, usually they have some type of insufficient peer review process which will make this uh, uh, you know you know these journals more likely to accept low quality articles. And uh, here's a graph that shows the uh, proliferation of research journals from 1680 or so uh, in you know, 1665 to 2005 and notice this scale is logarithmic. So what we're seeing here is the result of exponential growth. It's just that because this scale here is logarithmic, uh, we don't see an exponential curve. And living through 2020, we know what that is now. Uh, but if we would plot this normal, you know, with a normal scale here on the y-axis, we would see uh, a exponential curve. And we see that between uh, 2002 and 2014, 12 years, uh, we have had an additional maybe 
five or six thousand journals uh, you know be created so the point is that we have too many journals they're being created like crazy at an uh, unbelievable rate and that is leading to the proliferation of low quality journals so even though you might find a journal and they're trying their best honestly uh, they just may be low quality uh, so let me give you some examples uh, good uh, you know dear dr. William Ashton okay great uh, this journal uh, is asking me if I would like to submit an article for it uh, and uh, you know again this is an example of a predatory journal or a low uh, quality uh, non predatory journal uh, it says it has an impact factor of 0.8 and I'll explain what that is in a, just a little bit uh, but they could be lying uh, they claim that they have uh, that they're registered uh, you know uh, in the library system we don't really know uh, so uh, you know what we have here is an unsolicited email uh, in which they're asking me uh, to uh, submit an article also uh, you know uh, I get emails like this asking me to serve on editorial boards uh, so this to me is a clear giveaway that this is uh, probably a predatory journal uh, may not be maybe just poor quality but these are certainly the hallmarks of a predatory journal uh, so you have a predatory journal or a journal that you just don't recognize how do you tell if it's a good journal or not and so what students have to do nowadays is they have to investigate journals once you start to recognize journals in the field you know that JPSP the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology it is a high quality journal but you don't know that yet and I can't teach you every <laughs> high quality journal uh, in the field because there's lots of them uh, so uh, what I need to do is teach you how to uh, identify that they are good quality or not so you need to investigate and that's how you avoid the predatory and low quality journals uh, so one thing that you need to keep in mind is that there are several journal and library uh, organizations uh, which certify uh, publish, publishing ethics and so these are Uh, the titles of the journals that I mean of the organizations which do certify journals as uh, you know ethically publishing and so I would say if you're investigating a journal go to their website and look to see if they list that they're a member of these organizations but then again that may be a lie on their website so if they say that they work in association with the Committee on Publication Ethics then I would go to the Committee on Publication Ethics website and I would look to see if they list that journal as working with them or being a member uh, journal. So it really is a uh, caveat emptor, buyer beware situation. You have to uh, not trust anyone uh, in this situation in terms of uh, identifying the quality of journals. And so uh, an example uh, last semester I had a couple students in my 430 course uh, bring me articles from cognition brain and behavior and the articles were very poor quality and so I'm not gonna you know make any statements about what's going on with this journal uh, but I will use it as an example uh, because here's the journal's website and this is probably one of the first things that you should do in investigating the journal is that you should go to the website of the journal and look to see what they say about themselves and this looks okay this looks okay this looks okay but now let's start being uh, sleuths and investigators uh, so they say that they're abstracted on EBSCO and psych info well uh, you need to investigate to see if these claims are true so I would go over to psych info and I would look to see if I can find 
uh, cognition, brain, and behavior on that uh, you know index. Uh, also, and I'll say this later on, get back to it later on, they say they have an impact factor of 0.15. Uh, so that looks very professional, this little uh, widget here. Uh, but you know, I would have to go and make sure that it actually has this ranking, and they're just not out and out lying. And again, I'm not accusing this journal of anything, uh, but what I'm just going through is what I would do to determine uh, if this journal was a good quality journal. I would want to, for example, examine who is on the editorial board, and also you can see they have a page on publishing ethics, uh, but then again, do you trust them? And uh, you really can't tr trust what's on a web page. Uh, but what I di uh, generally do is I look at the editorial board, and here's the editorial board, and so what I would do is I would choose uh, the uh, chair or the uh, editor uh, and look them up and on their own, not just from the pages of the website of the journal that is in question, but uh, you know, in other sources, which I'll show you how to do in a minute, and go to their college website, uh, Google them, and just see what information that you can get about them. And again, when you go to their own websites, uh, for example, if you go to, uh, where we go here, uh, Robert Goldstone's uh, web page, uh, make sure that he says that he is on the editorial board of Cognition, Brain, and Behavior, an interdisciplinary journal, uh, because they may be lying that he is on their board. Uh, and, of course, here I go to the publishing ethics, uh, and they talk about publishing ethics. I don't see them talking about any uh, you know, organizations they're members of, but if they did uh, mention that they were members of an organization, uh, that they, I would definitely uh, you know, go to that organization's website and see if they also list them as being associated. But also, we see this here, uh, Cy Imago Institute rankings and Brain Behavior and Interdisciplinary Journal. Uh, it is given a ranking of 0.15. What does that mean? And so let's talk about what that means. Scientometrics. Uh, that is the measurement of publishing in uh, science fields. Uh, and so what this field is, is uh, they look at how you can quantify and rank the publications of an author, a researcher, a journal, or whatever. And so there are two major uh, Scientometrics metrics that we look at. One is impact factor and the other is the H factor. And so we'll talk about both of those right now. So impact factor is usually a journal level metric and probably that 0.15 is some version of an impact factor uh, and uh, because you can only calculate impact factors on journals not on individuals and how do you do that uh, the impact factor is simply this the number of citations uh, you know in a given year or two year period and they need to state what that is uh, divided by the number of articles published. So it's just a simple, uh, you know, uh, dividend, dividend, right? I'll have to look that up. The result of a uh, division, uh, you know, operation. Uh, you know, you just take the number of citations uh, every article in that uh, journal for a year gets, and then you divide it by the number of articles. So, for example, Nature, uh, heavy hitting, uh, huge, uh, you know, journal. In 2017, uh, they published uh, 1,782 articles total, and that was over a two-year period. 
uh, and then uh, 74,090 citations were made to those 1782 articles. And so you just take those numbers and divide them out, and that gives you a 41.58. And so nature's impact factor was uh, 42, or their impact factor uh, was an impact factor of 41.58, uh, which means that uh, on average, the average article in nature was cited 42 times. So it's, that's essentially what the impact factor is telling us. The idea of impact does make sense. It's the idea that if in science your article is important, it will be cited, and it will be cited by other authors. So that, that does make sense. So we're going to be looking for the impact factor or some version of it, uh, and uh, you know, it will be uh, you know, something to the effect of the number of citations divided by the number of articles. Uh, what about in psychology? Uh, well, here are some example impact factors. Uh, health psych, 3.1. History of psych, 0.8. Consulting and clinical, which is one of the big, bigger journals in uh, clinical psychology, 4.6. Uh, abnormal psych, 6.5. JPSP, uh, one of the biggest in psychology, impact factor of 6.3 and psychological bulletin uh, 20.9. Psych bulletin has that huge impact factor because they're publishing a lot of uh, you know literature reviews or meta-analyses which people just cite all over the place. Uh, but these numbers here are good uh, rubrics for the sizes of impact factors you would expect from psychology uh, journals. And how do you find an impact factor? Well, you got to go to York College Library and you have to uh, use Scopus. And uh, this may take a little work. You may have to talk to a librarian and have something set be set up. And uh, once you set up Scopus, then you can just in a snap type in the n uh, name of the journal and you can get the impact factor. And uh, here we go. Uh, when I typed in brain behavior and brain cognition, brain, brain and behavior, brain, uh, <laughs> uh, an interdisciplinary journal, uh, the site source impact factor for 2019 was 0.3, and if we go back 0.3. That that's even less than history of psych, which is one of the lowest of the group of examples I gave you. So. That, uh, for a research journal, that's a kind of a low uh, level. And if you click the I here, it will tell you exactly how they calculate it. And for site source, it is the impact factor equation I gave you, which is citations divided by uh, articles. And uh, here we have what they were touting on their web page, the SJR uh, you know, uh, metric which is 0.15. I don't know what that is, but if you click on this, it will tell you how they calculate it. And then SNP, don't know what that is, but if you click on there, uh, they will tell you how they, they calculate it. So Scopus is a very easy way of getting information about uh, you know, impact factors from journals. Uh, and again, going directly to Scopus, you can trust Scopus. You can't trust what the web pages say. And uh, then we have the H index, uh, which is a different type of psychometric uh, metric. And this is an author-based metric. And so what you can do is you can find uh, the impact of a author, one individual author. And I said before that you could go and look at the uh, you know, impact uh, scores of the editorial board if they are really on the editorial board. And that could give you an uh, idea of how uh, you know prestigious the uh, editorial board is if they are actually used. <laughs> so not only do you have to worry about the website lying to you about somebody being on, 
the editorial board, but then again you have to worry about if they do have somebody who knows they're on the editorial board, if they never use the editorial board, then it doesn't really matter. So, uh, you know, that may, this is just an illustration about how sticky this has become, really. Uh, nobody talked about this when I was in graduate school, and I think many of these psychometric, uh, you know, uh, numbers didn't exist or existed, but only in the field of psychometrics, and any psychologist would never know about this. Now uh, it's a joke how much uh, you know people are concerned about their H in indexes and or journals impact factor. Uh, you know, so this morass of questionable ethics popped up in the last 10 to 15 years. It's just amazing. And uh, this is my first lecture on it. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm a little behind the game. Uh, but I think a lot of uh, psychologists are behind the game. Uh, the H index is for individual people, and the way you do that is you rank order publications by the number of citations, and the last position uh, which citations are greater or equal to the position is their H index. What, huh? Let's do an example, because I had to work out an example to understand this myself. Let's say that some dude or dudette has this publication record. That is, in 2015 they published uh, an article, and this indicates one article, but it got 10 citations. Uh, in 2017 they published two articles. One was cited four times, the other was cited three times. In 2018 they published one article and it was cited five times. And in 2019, last year, uh, they cited a, they published one paper, and even in a year or so, it's been cited eight times. Wow, that's something. So as the rules say, number one, you rank order them. So this is the numbers that you're rank ordering, so it would be ordered this way. And then, oh, I got to go back and look. The last position in which citations are greater or equal to the position is their H index. So position one is 10 citations, so we skip that. Position two, eight, so we skip that. Position three, five, so we skip that. Position four equals the number of citations, so that is this author's uh, H index, an index of four. Uh, that's a very uh, unique way of doing it, but it's a very common uh, statistical uh, organizational way of doing it. So uh, what uh, the people in Sciotometrics did was just borrow this typical way of somehow ranking uh, you know, uh, the strength of different things. And so one thing you could do is you could look at the editor of uh, you know, Cognition, Brain and Behavior, an interdisciplinary uh, journal. And so uh, here we uh, have, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, her on Scopus, and we can look it up on Scopus. And here we have her H index, which is 16. Uh, what are rubrics or scales that we can use to evaluate that? Uh, well, this is a, uh, you know, uh, this is the editor of JPSP, uh, the, you know, top j experimental journal in social psychology and, and in a way, psychology, uh, you know, clinical and, and social psychology. And, uh, you know, uh, Colin has an H index of 28. So somebody who is prestigious enough to be the editor of JPSP uh, has an index of 28, and we can use that as somewhat of an index of, or somewhat of a scale to rank uh, the editor of uh, Cognition, Brain, and Behavior. So that gives us some indication of the quality of this journal. Uh, and in fact, if you go to her webpage, she does say that she is the editor. Uh, but then again, we don't know about the general, uh, you know, thoroughness of the editorial board. Not to say anything about her, uh, but 
again, this is something that you would go through in order to determine uh, the quality of a journal because it's no longer straightforward anymore uh, and you really do have to be very careful. So in terms of assignments, uh, when I give you an assignment to look up an article, uh, you know, in social psych we have the uh, social psych meme assignment. I'm asking you to look up a good article in social psych. Uh, once you find an article that you think you want to use, I would look up the impact factor of that journal uh, and I would look up the uh, H index of one of the researchers who are the authors. And if those indices are pretty high, uh, then you could feel comfortable that this is a good article that I would respond positively to. Uh, if the uh, you know H index and the IF pa factor or uh, impact factor are low, then you may want to find another article, uh, fearing that I may take it out on your grade, which I just might do. Oh, uh, as I said, uh, it's becoming a joke among uh, psychologists. This is the Oh, I forget what this is, but it's a web page of memes about being in graduate school. And so, brains, brains, I don't have a Scopus publication. Ooh, you know, it's, this has become so common in graduate school that it's a joke. Okay, so uh, let's talk about a couple good things that are happening that are new, like in the last five years. Uh, and uh, you know, two of those good things are open access and preprint print journals. And I'm mentioning them now because students will not understand what an open access journal is and they will uh, uh, turn away from an open access article that they could use because they think that it's not something appropriate or something that I would feel appropriate. And then also students will see a preprint article as the same as a uh, printed research article. And that is not the case. Uh, so uh, we need to talk about these two different uh, types of journals. So let's first talk about open access journals. Uh, you know, if you get to 430, you'll probably hear me rant about uh, how unfair uh, academic publication is. Uh, it is a basically rip-off job on uh, researchers and college professors. They do all the work and the journals make all the money and they make a ton of money. Uh, and really who's paying for that research? Well you are. The research that I do is being paid by your state taxes. So if you're paying me to do research if I publish that research, you should be able to see it for free and you shouldn't have to pay JPSP $400 uh, a year to see that research. Uh, so some people understand the same, have the same sensitivities also. And so they say research should be free and it should not be behind a paywall and anybody can look at it for free. And some people have formed journals under this uh, you know, idea and these are called open access journals. Uh, journals uh, should be free and you should be able to read any article for free, so no paywalls. Frontiers in Psychology is one of the major, if not the only, uh, open access journal in psychology. And is it a good journal? Impact Factor 2.06, so you uh, uh, make your own uh, judgment based on what I told you about that. Oh, uh, uh, just a little joke as a, uh, uh, you know, uh, segue. Uh, does he bite? Nobody can hurt in other ways. How many citations did you get this month? Mm -hmm. And again, it was not like this when I was in graduate school, but these are the things graduate students are focused on uh, today. Preprint journals are, as the name implied, uh, journals which present or print articles before they have been accepted for publication in a 
uh, normal journal. Uh, and it's just as the name implies, and this is seen as a solution to publishing lag. Publishing lag is the lag between when you finish a research article and when it finally ends up published, which could be one to two years or even longer. And one part of that lag is the backlog of articles waiting to be published. Articles have been accepted for publication, uh, but they, there's no room in the journal yet. Uh, and so they're just in line waiting to be published. What if, for example, this is an important topic? Uh, you, you know, nobody knows about this. Uh, so just as the name implies, some people say, well, it's important for some articles to be published before they're published. And so we're going to start a preprint journal to present, and I'm doing a present gesture with my hands, I don't know why, you can't see it, but to present uh, articles to the public that have not been published yet. And what that means really depends. Uh, it could mean that the article has not gone through the peer review process. It could mean that the researcher submitted the article to a journal. The journal has yet to decide whether to publish it or not. Uh, and then they say, well, I want people to know about it right now, so I send it off to a preprint journal. Uh, and then what could happen is later on, uh, the uh, you know, journal they sent it to could peer review it and reject it. Uh, but then that version of the article, the manuscript, was on the preprint journal and people were looking at it assuming that it was of high quality. And uh, here is a graphic on the uh, you know, preprint process and the printing process, the rounds of drafting and informal feedback. Uh, you know, preprint, the work is in progress, it's a submitted version. Uh, you know, submitted uh, to a journal for peer review. Uh, then there's the post-print phase where uh, you have the author accepted manuscript uh, and then they're getting ready to publish it and so it has to be copy, uh, edited, typeset, and formatted. And then only after there can it be published. And so these are just some of the steps in the publishing process. Uh, which illustrates how long it can take to get uh, an article published. Uh, for example, you know, other things can slow it down also. For example, I submitted a manuscript to a journal once and I did not hear from the journal for one year before they said that they actually sent it to the uh, you know, peer review board. So my article sat on somebody's desk for a year before it was submitted to the peer review uh, board. And then it has to go through this whole process of you know, uh, being reviewed, uh, possibly going through revisions, and then being uh, copy edited and ready for uh, you know, the journal. And then it has to wait for the lag. And so you can imagine how uh, you know, long that could be. So we have published journals or you know, gold level journals, and then we have gray level journals, which are preprints. Uh, and these are journal, you know, these are usually websites which just list or just house the preprints of articles or manuscripts that have been submitted either for peer review or some type of publishing. And then uh, some preprint websites are green level in that the article has been accepted by the journal, uh, but it's just not been printed yet. Uh, it has to be formatted, it has to be uh, copy set, it has to wait for the publishing lag. Uh, it has to wait in line to be published. So again, uh, you know, uh, this is what the preprint or postprint uh, journals or online journals what they actually mean. Uh, in psychology, one of the major ones is psych, uh, RX, RXIV. I don't know how that's pronounced uh, because it's so new. Uh, it's a free preprint service for the psychological sciences. Uh, and so 
uh, you know, if you run across anything from uh, Psych AR XIV, uh, then you know it's a preprint. It has not been peer reviewed, so it's not part of that gold standard of you know primary empirical and peer reviewed uh, type of uh, journals. And to give you an example of uh, what type of articles will show up in a preprint journal, uh, this was posted on a preprint journal, an online journal, uh, March 26, 2020. And look at the title, Pande uh, Pandemic Depresses the Economy, uh, Public Health Interventions Do Not, Evidence from the 1918 Flu. And of course, uh, it this article has been submitted for publication someplace. Uh, but it will take uh, from you know in February or March of 2020. It would take maybe a year or two or three for it to come to light any place else in a journal, if at all. And so what these authors have done is they submitted it to a preprint website, and they uh, posted it on the preprint website March 26. So now it would be able to be found on some uh, indexing sites and of course on a Google search or a Google Scholar search. And of course this is why we have preprint sites. Uh, this, we need to know this right now. Uh, you know, we need to know whether or not uh, you know, uh, shutting down the economy is going to have a lasting impact on our economy in the future. Uh, and they definitely conclude that you know uh, social distancing measures and non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions uh, they they do not negatively impact the economy in the long term, but the amount of damage that a pandemic does does uh, impact the economy over the long term. So that is information that we need right now and we needed right away. And so uh, now we're in the situation, well, how do we know about the quality of this research? Well, we don't. Uh, one thing that you can do uh, is that you can look at uh, the authors and you can research them and look up their age indices. And if they have, you know, you know, decent H industry H indices, then you may say to yourself, well, that adds a little bit in terms of how much I would believe or accept them. But still, it has not been peer reviewed, so I really don't know to wholeheartedly accept the findings of this article. And so uh, that's exactly what I did. Uh, looked at the H industry H indices of a couple of their uh, authors and Werner his age index was five uh, Korea uh, his was six and so here's a couple uh, examples of H uh, scores by position and by discipline uh, you know uh, some of these people were economists so uh, on average the average economist uh, you know has an H index of uh, 4.8 meaning that they're at least average. And then uh, what I did was I looked uh, at positions and one of these is actually a assistant professor, professor or lecturer and the average H score of a lecturer is a 2.21. So I think it was him. Uh, he has a very good H index for being an assistant professor. And uh, again, we see here uh, this table breaks down the H indices and we see that in economics for a lecturer 3.11 so yeah that is a, a pretty good H index but again even though you can trust these authors uh, you don't know if you can trust the inner workings of the paper unless you can evaluate it yourself and uh, the statistics that they did was a little bit over my head uh, so uh, I would have to wait until I hear uh, about the results of a peer review process before I say anything about their findings. And there's Luna, and so we're ready uh, to uh, 
you know, say goodbye. So these are some of the things that you need to do uh, in the current uh, environment to ensure that what you're talking about in your work is, uh, you know, accurate. All right. Good day, everybody.